they both stood on top of the world. Sparta, an invincible land force. Athens, a naval power, like no other. This is to be a clash of titans, with long-lasting consequences. This is the Peloponnesian War. After the failed Persian invasion, Greece became a foremost superpower in the old world. They entered a period of untold scientific, philosophical, and architectural achievement. A Greek age of culture flourished. But behind the curtain, it was Greece's politics, the very force responsible for its great advancements, that turned into Greece's greatest weakness. a toxic and sinister backdrop to a golden age of brightness. The threat of the Persian Wars could have unified all of mainland Greece, and while it did create alliances, it never brought the entire Hellenic League together into one polity. Greece was still a collection of independent city-states, and it remained so even after the invasion. With the Persians repelled from the mainland, the Greek coalition was able to force a counter-attack, after Mikali, the Greek city-states in Ionia revolted against Persian rule again, and were supported by Athens. Though Sparta wanted to stay out of further conflict with the Persians, they were forced to support the cause as well. They didn't want Athens to take the prominent role in the Hellenic League. Pausanias, Spartan regent and general, got to keep his position as leader of the Hellenic land forces. He had success in taking back Cyprus and Byzantium from the Persians, but tensions would soon begin to rise between Athens and Sparta. After some prisoners escaped, rumors soon spread that Pausanias had willingly freed them and was working with the Persians. Rumors grew strong enough that Sparta called Pausanias back home to stand trial. Though acquitted, Pausanias had lost his people's trust. According to Thucydides, in 477 BCE, Pausanias sought refuge from the ephors at the Temple of Athena. His own mother, disowning him, laid down a brick at the entrance. Others then followed, and before long, Pausanias was walled inside. With no way out, he died of starvation. Themistocles would later have his day as well. He grew arrogant, and around 472 BCE, was accused of being part of the same Persian plot his Spartan counterpart, Pausanias, had been accused. He was ostracized, and fled east, becoming an advisor in the Persian court. And so, the Greeks drove out both their Spartan leader who led them to victory at Plataea, and their Athenian admiral who triumphed at Salamis. With Pausanias gone, Xanthippus was placed as head of the Hellenic League, but this caused resentment in the Spartan ranks. They, along with the other city-states of the Peloponnese, left the alliance. Athens then founded a new alliance in 478 BCE. A new league to take back the land which the Achaemenid Empire had conquered in the preceding decades. This new alliance was called the Delian League, so named because the official meeting place of these allied city-states would be on the island of Delos. In response to this, the Spartans would form the Peloponnesian League, which initially only had states from the Peloponnese, and they remained fairly isolationist. Athens, on the other hand, used their more advanced navy to take back the islands and other cities that had fallen to the Persians. During the 470s BCE, the Athenian alliance drove out the Persians from Thrace and many Aegean islands, under Cimon, an Athenian politician, and son of Miltiades, winning general from the Battle of Marathon. In the 460s BCE, they liberated the Anatolian coast and the Greek cities in Ionia. While cities in the alliance paid Athens to help with their campaigns, the Persian menace was no more, so many felt there was no reason to keep providing money. In the 460s BCE, the island of Naxos even attempted to leave the alliance. 
The response was an Athenian siege that forced Naxos into compliance. Xanthippus, the prominent Athenian general, would die in the mid-470s BCE, but he had a son, named Pericles. He became the foremost politician in Athens. Demonstrating both charisma and populist zeal, he brought Athenian democracy to its peak. He was the one responsible for the building and beautification projects that made Athens a cultural center in classical Greek history. A golden age of art, science, and philosophy would bloom. We'll get to some of those achievements in our very next episode, so be sure to subscribe. Over time, Athens had moved the Alliance headquarters from Delos to Athens itself. Tributes received were used only for Athens or Attica. In Athens, Pericles undertook a project of gargantuan proportions. On the Acropolis, still laid the ruins of the temples destroyed by the Persian invasion. Under Pericles, a new Parthenon was built, honoring Athena. This project cost the equivalent of one billion of today's US dollars. One of the more consequential projects was the building of walls from the port of Piraeus, down to the city proper, a distance of around 8 miles, or almost 13 kilometers. These long walls were to serve as protection for goods and soldiers coming in from the port. If Athens was ever besieged, this made it possible to still get food or supplies. In Olympia, in the Peloponnese, a statue of Zeus was built at the temple, seeking to outdo their Athenian rivals. It was over 40 feet tall, 12 meters, and was sculpted with gold and ivory. Described by countless sources as majestic, the statue is regarded as a wonder of the ancient world. Though to the average onlooker, Athens was a place of culture, learning, and general optimism, behind the likes of Socrates, Plato, Aristophanes, and others, there was the dark underbelly of political machinations. Our good friend and fellow historian, Herodotus, left the city, and Thucydides, dubbed the father of scientific history, was ostracized as well. The great statesman and general, Cimon, was also ostracized for being too pro-Spartan. He had led Athenian forces into Sparta to help quell the Helot revolt, but this help was rejected as well. Sparta didn't want to risk the Athenians using it as an opportunity to spread democracy in the Peloponnese. The philosopher Socrates would find himself victim to Athenian authority and behind vague accusations of corrupting the youth and undermining the state religion was forced to commit suicide in 399 BCE. Athens didn't just become an empire overnight. It took decades. Over time, Sparta and the Peloponnesian League felt more threatened. All that was needed was a spark for these tensions to ignite into devastation. Around 460 BCE, the neighboring city-states of Corinth and Megara, part of the Peloponnesian League, had a border dispute. Athens had become wildly interventionist, so when Megara asked them for aid, they gladly took it upon themselves to be a part of this disagreement. Siding with Megara, Athens sent troops to protect its borders and help the city-state build fortifications against Corinth. In reality, this was a strategic preemptive defensive move. For Sparta, it was bad enough seeing Athens exert their imperial dominance in Ionia, the Aegean, and Thrace, but now they were inching into the Peloponnese itself. In 457 BCE, the Spartans finally took action. A war had broken out between Phokis and Doris. Usually not a cause for action, the Spartans saw this as an opportunity, and dispatched an army to assist Doris, both sharing the Dorian ethnicity. The Phokians would quickly accept peace terms, but while the Spartans were there, the Athenian fleet blocked the Corinthian Gulf. At this point, the Spartans marched through Boeotia, gathering more troops. While they would have to go this way in order to return to the Peloponnese via the Isthmus, they were determined to put a stop to Athens' expansion, so marched towards Attica. Rumors have it that there were forces inside the city ready to willingly betray Athens for the Spartans, making an attack not such a far-fetched proposition. 
but Athens never gave them a chance. They sent an army of their own north, and the two forces met near the border of Attica and Boeotia. They clashed at the Battle of Tanagra, with both sides suffering heavy losses. In the end, Sparta showed they were still the master of land warfare, and won the fight. But were now too weak to march on Athens, so returned home. Athens then went on a campaign to punish the Boeotians, who aided Sparta during their invasion attempt. This is how Megara became so important. With the isthmus blocked off at Megara, and the gulf filled with Athenian ships, the Spartans were effectively kept out of mainland Greece. Though now soaring, this Athenian empire would soon meet difficulty. After a failed attempt to overthrow the Persians in Egypt, Athens became filled with internal strife and threats of revolt all over their territory in the Aegean, around 455 BCE. They decided to make peace with Sparta, and in 451 BCE, called back the ostracized Cimon to conduct the peace talks. He succeeded in garnering a five-year truce, then went on another campaign against the Persians, this time in Cyprus. While they were eventually victorious, Cimon died during the initial siege. This left Pericles in sole control of Athens. He hadn't been as pro-Spartan as Cimon, so this would not be beneficial for relations. With Cimon's death, more regions began to revolt, this time, on the mainland. The Boeotians erupted in revolt in 447 BCE, and then the island of Euboea soon after. Once Megara revolted, the Spartans had their path back onto the mainland, and back towards Attica. They did make a half-hearted attempt to invade Athens, but were turned back, possibly from bribery. In the end, neither side really wanted this fight. With Athens dealing with rebellions all over, and the Spartans always with the threat of their slave population rebelling, they brokered a more long-lasting truce, called the Thirty Years' Peace. Both sides would abstain from interfering in the other's affairs. Athens agreed to return Megara to the Peloponnesian League. Though they had lost Megara and Boeotia, they were still the head of the Delian League. This first Peloponnesian War would last from 460 to 445 BCE. By the 430s BCE, a series of events would occur that led to an even more disastrous war. Athens became involved with some colonies of Corinth, and imposed sanctions on Megara, both members of the Peloponnesian League. Seen as a violation of the treaty, the Spartan assembly declared war on Athens in 431 BCE, with a bit of coaxing from Corinth. The first phase of this long conflict was called the Archidamian War, and lasted until 421 BCE. This saw both Sparta and Athens attempt to use their military specialties to defeat the other. Athens took their fleet, and attacked the Peloponnese by sea. Sparta and its allies, other than Corinth, were mostly land-based, so repeatedly attacked Attica by land. Pericles moved those from the countryside into Athens, and protected by the long walls, withstood the siege. The port of Piraeus, also walled off, gave them access to the grain they needed to sustain themselves and the defense of the city. Pericles had Athens rely mainly on their fleet, and it appeared to be a good plan. The Athenian walls kept out the invaders, but there was still one point of entry. In 430 BCE, the ships coming into the port of Piraeus brought with them an additional delivery. Plague with the influx of people seeking refuge and the overcrowding within the Athenian walls, the disease had the perfect environment to spread. Pericles himself caught the ailment, and by 429 BCE, he was dead. It's thought to have killed up to 100,000 people, around one quarter of the population. The saving grace was that the Spartans abandoned their siege, as none wanted contact with the diseased Athenians. With Pericles dead, another prominent voice rose in Athens, that of Cleon. 
Cleon was always squarely against Pericles and his defensive strategies, and opted to go on the offensive. Historian Thucydides looks on Cleon as a warmongering demagogue. He attempted to fight back, and had some victories, but General Brasidas, of the Spartans was quite capable himself. Cleon and Brasidas would meet at the Battle of Amphipolis, an Athenian region of Thrace. Though it was a decisive victory for the Spartans, both Cleon and Brasidas perished. By 421 BCE, hostages were exchanged, and both sides called a truce. The death of Cleon and Brasidas brought with it a period of peace, as both were interventionist warmongers for their respective cities. About six years later, in 415 BCE, one of Athens' allies in Sicily, Segesta, was having problems with the dominant force on the island. This was the historic city of Syracuse. They were a colony from Corinth, ethnically Dorian like the Spartans, and the most wealthy city in the region by far. Athens wagered that if they were to take Syracuse, it would not only hurt Corinth, a Spartan ally, but the accumulated wealth, could be used to build an unstoppable fleet of triremes to finally end this war, that seemed to never end. In the end Athens could even expand to take over Italy, and then Carthage, and become the unbridled master of all Greek states. This fervor was driven by Alcibiades, a prominent orator and capable general. Before the voyage though, statues of Hermes were desecrated, all over the city. The prime suspect for this sacrilege, was Alcibiades himself. To avoid the death penalty, the charismatic general fled, to Sparta. Less esteemed generals were to then take his place on this campaign. Visions of grandeur still in their heads, the Athenians launched the Sicilian expedition. It was initially a force of 134 warships, 5,000 hoplites, and other various troops. Needless to say the victory was decisive. But not for the Athenians. By 413 BCE, the entire Athenian fleet and army was destroyed, the soldiers killed, or sold into slavery. This reignited the war, but Athens and the Spartans just came to a stalemate once again. Sparta would then get its edge though, from a most unlikely source. There was only one other entity that hated Athens at this point, more than the Spartans. Sensing Athenian weakness, the Persians, returned. They allied themselves with Sparta, offering them money and better ships. In return, once the Athenian Empire fell, they would get to reclaim the Greek states in Ionia, on the Anatolian coast. With a new state-of-the-art Spartan fleet, also came a new general. His name was Lysander. Though his mother was a helot, he went through the agoge system and was eager to prove his mettle. This new boost, along with the devastation in Athens from the recurring plague, and disastrous Sicilian expedition, shifted the scales towards Sparta, even at sea. Under Lysander, the Athenians lost numerous naval engagements from 407 to 405 BCE. It culminated in the Battle of Egospotami, where Lysander and his fleet destroyed almost the entire Athenian navy. He then sailed to Athens, and with no naval resistance, arranged a blockade on the port of Piraeus. With no way to communicate with the rest of the empire, and no way to import food, Athens began negotiations, and within three months, surrendered in 404 BCE, ending this second and all-important Peloponnesian War. The Delian League was disbanded, Athens' ships destroyed, and the Athenian Empire dissolved. Athens was also forced to knock down their protective long walls. Lysander put into power an oligarchy of 30 tyrants, known initially as the Thirty, to rule over Athens, along with a small garrison of troops. Though the Thirty ruled the city for less than a year, they were responsible for a new period of tyranny, which saw pro-democratic Athenians exiled, property confiscated, and up to 5% of the population executed in a reign of terror. Desperate for help, those exiled Athenians with influence sought refuge in Boeotia and Corinth, 
and planned a counterattack. This resulted in the Phyle campaign, in which exiled Athenians, led by Thrasybulus, overthrew the Thirty. The Spartans responded, but the Spartan king opened negotiations, and restored Athenian democracy. Athens was back, but was a shell of its former self. In the meadows of Laconia, overlooking all, stood Sparta, now the new sole superpower of all Greece. In the wake of the war, Greece stood devastated. Athens was especially pummeled, with both the war and plague. Grain production was delayed and erratic, and starvation remained a source of discord. Many Greeks, looking for a more stable way of living, became mercenaries. One of these was Xenophon, an Athenian who traveled to Persia, and was wrapped up in a plot involving the Achaemenid Empire. We'll get to that story in our next chapter. With Sparta now unchallenged, and feeling very confident, they cancelled their deal with the Persians to give up the Greek cities in Ionia. Now that these cities were free of Athens, the Spartans wanted them for themselves. To show how serious they were, they sent garrisons under their king, Agesilaus II. The other Greek city-states looked down on this flagrant display of imperialism. A coalition formed between Athens and Argos, two historical rivals of Sparta, along with Corinth and Thebes, two of Sparta's former allies in the Peloponnesian War, who had not been properly rewarded by Sparta after their win. Delegations were held at Corinth, and in 395 BCE, they declared war, the Corinthian War. Agesilaus had to return from Ionia, to deal with this. Despite winning some battles early on, the tide would turn, once Persia joined the Allies, now seeing Sparta as a bigger threat. At the Battle of Nidus, the Persians destroyed a Spartan fleet in Ionia, effectively reminding Sparta that even though they won the Peloponnesian War with their fleet, they were not meant to be a maritime power. The Spartans gave up their holdings in Ionia, but with the Spartan fleet destroyed, Athens looked to regain some of its former territory in the Delian League. Now, it was Athens who threatened the Persians, so they switched sides and began to back Sparta. This forced the Athenians and their coalition to seek peace. The Persians became the X-Factor, able to tip the balance of power in Greece. In 387 BCE, after years of war, the Persians exerted this power, and their king, Artaxerxes II, issued both sides an ultimatum. Ionia and Cyprus were to remain in Persian hands, the Athenians had to cede back the land taken in the Aegean, and their alliance had to dissolve. City-states were to remain autonomous, and no leagues were to be formed, as once banded together, they could threaten Sparta. This treaty was called the King's Peace. This led to another period of Spartan hegemony, only this time they exerted it on the mainland instead of Ionia. They sent garrisons to various cities to maintain the peace, and began campaigning to far-off territory to the north. Over time, they became as hated as Athens had been just a few decades earlier. In 378 BCE, led by Epaminondas, Thebes revolted against its Spartan garrison, and pushed back against this Spartan hegemony. After numerous invasions, the Spartans had amassed a better force by 371 BCE, and sent it towards Thebes, in Boeotia. In a surprising twist of fate, the Boeotians and Thebans, earned a decisive victory at the Battle of Leuctra. Not only was Epaminondas' tactics instrumental in the battle, by stacking their left flank, the Thebans also relied on a special troop of 300 soldiers in their ranks, named the Sacred Band of Thebes. This was made up of 150 couples of male lovers. Thebes would soon launch an invasion of their own into the Peloponnese, freeing the Helots, and culminating with the Battle of Mantinea in 362 BCE. Though the Thebans won a tactical victory, Epaminondas met his demise, some of his last words, urging his people to make peace. A treaty was signed, and out of seemingly nowhere, it wasn't Athens, or Sparta, but Thebes, that was now the preeminent power in Greece. Athens had used this period to sweep the Aegean once again, and cobbled together a second Athenian empire, leaving Sparta the most broken and weakened state to end this period. 
Thebes wouldn't get to relish in their glory for long either. An external power was expanding, and it wasn't the Persians. Next episode, we travel back to the more cultural aspects of ancient Greece, but after that, we find out what ultimately took it over.